Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo bros welcome back to the yo elliot show elliot Hulls podcast and we got an amazing guest here today who is an apologist someone was asking me what an a, a apologist was a few moments ago and i thought it was somebody that defends the faith with facts is that a good way to describe it yeah, I agree. I, I, I do. I believe that would be a great way to lay it out, Elliot. Um, you defend the faith and you lay out the history and the factual information. I think it'd be a great way to, to lay it out. Nice. So we're going to be defending the faith with facts with William Albrecht. Uh, William also happens to be a power lifter and he showed me his lifting belt. Would you, would you show that to people? It's pretty cool. Yeah, I got it right here. Yeah. Mary there. We got Christ. You got uh, the the presentation of the temple there. Uh, I got uh, you got the the great Saint Ambrose, and on the other side I've got um, Blessed Dun Scotus. I have the great Augustine. I got a lot there. Wow! Hey, this is my powerlifting belt. It looks like a stained glass window. Beauty, a lot of beauty. Yeah, it really yeah. That's one thing about yeah. the Catholic faith is uh, how beautiful so much of the art is and the architecture and stuff. So. You know, William uh, also is a convert uh, from evangelicalism. And uh, from our previous talks, um, he, a big part of his conversion was studying the church fathers. And so his website is called Patristic Pillars. The YouTube channel is Patristic Pillars. And I thought that would be a good launching off point for our Second interview, right? Those of you guys who have been around, you can watch the previous one where we answered a lot of tough Catholic questions. But today, I'd like to begin with who are the church fathers and why are they important? Yeah, Elliot, great, uh, great way to begin. Number one, people will hear church fathers. A lot of the times they get confused. Well, what are you talking about? Um, they at times think we're talking about priests and only priests. Well, a lot of them were. A lot of them were bishops, some deacons, but a lot of them weren't. A lot of them were merely apologists. And when we talk about early church fathers, we're talking about those disciples of the apostles that were taught and trained by them. Now, I can think of two very early examples, Ignatius of Antioch and Bishop Polycarp, both taught and trained by the apostle John. So when we talk about early church fathers, we talk about those figures that wrote Outside of the New Testament, after the end of the New Testament, they were either taught and trained by an apostle directly or by a disciple of that apostle. And we can name tons of them, Elliot, in an unbroken line. We have different eras of church fathers. We call the earliest ones, those that were directly taught and trained by the apostles, apostolic fathers. After them, we have an era called the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Sometimes people say anti and people think A-N-T-I. No, anti, think of it from the Latin, think of the Spanish antes, before, 
anti-Nicene before the, the, the Council of Nicaea. Those are figures writing in the 100s all the way to the early 4th century. And then we get to the Nicene, and then post-Nicene era, and then we get to the later, later Golden Era Fathers, such as a very, very largely considered by scholarship the last church father, the great John Damascene. But the great point, the, the amazing point you bring up, Elliot, they're important. Who were they? They are these figures. We can trace them in an unbroken line right to the, to the head, to Christ, and to his apostles. So if I understand correctly, these are the men that we can look to to define what the early church believed, the early church practices, maybe some of the dogma and doctrine. Um, tell us a little bit about how that apostolic tradition that is found in those fathers of the first few centuries point back to uh, the Catholic expression of the faith, like their liturgy and some of the dogmas. Uh, what, what can we look to them to sort of assert that the Catholic Church is where the root is found? Yeah, I think of, of, of particular teachings that are distinctly Catholic. And I think of the fact that you have a figure by the name of Ignatius of Antioch, taught and trained by John the Apostle, writing in the early 100s to the Church of Smyrna. And he tells them, that wherever they go in the world, they can find that one true church. And how do you find it? You look for that church that, was, that is called the Catholic Church. Now, today our modern evangelical friends try to say, well, Catholic merely means universal. Granted, we give them that. The Greek Catholicos means universal. But Ignatius was using it as a proper title to point to a particular church. And when we look at what that particular church believed, Elliot, they believed that the Eucharist was truly the body and blood of Christ. They believed in prayer for the dead. They believed in purgatory, veneration of the saints, giving honor to Holy Mary. Mary was all sinless. Mary was ever virgin. And on and on. I can go on and on. They believed things that were distinctly Catholic. And I want to add one other really important point. They had a, even though the Bible had, people weren't walking around with a leather skin King James Version, they utilized books that today we believe are canonical, that are part of the Bible, that our evangelical friends do not have in their Bibles. When you look in the early church, Eliot, one, two, three, four, five hundreds, any era you go to, you will find early writers, male and female, that were warriors for the faith that would be willing to go to their death defending the faith, and they believed things that were distinctly Catholic. That's why I became Catholic. So at this time, first century through the fifth century, uh, there were other splinter versions of Christianity that didn't hold fast to the apostolic tradition? Yeah, that, that is a great, great uh, point you bring up. Because if you look in 2 Thessalonians 2, there we read about holding fast to the traditions, whether written by whether written or by word of mouth, which would show us that sacred tradition, even better, let me open it up, that the word of God can be passed on either in written form or in oral form. And in the early eras of church history, we run into groups like the Gnostics, the Donatists, uh, the Arians, the Semi-Arians, the Nestorians, the Eutychians, and on and on and on through, through these first several centuries of church history. They didn't hold to that tradition, to that teaching. But Elliot, here's another thing that will get brought up. People are going to say, well, William and Elliot, who are you to say that your particular tradition was a correct one? How do you know it wasn't the others? Right. Why not the Gnostics, man? You guys won the day through brutality. How do you know yours is the right one? Well, Elliot, I'm going to tell you how. When we look at the early church fathers, we don't only look at them. We look at hostile witnesses as well. Figures like Celsus, Lucian, all these enemies of the faith. And then you look and you read, what are they saying? They're talking about the church that followed the teachings of Christ. And they're not, I remember, they're, they don't, they're not Christians. They don't believe 
but they're identifying these followers of the Christ as believing the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ and believing things that are particularly Catholic. So you know, even through the enemies of the faith, that that one true church believed a particular way and they believed the Catholic way. Thus, these Gnostic groups and all these other groups that went their other way, another group I forgot, the Montanists, they believed contrary to what the one true church of Christ believed. And there are many of them that we can point to. So would it be safe to say that these were like OG Protestants? Yeah, no doubt. Great, great point there because uh, one particular OG Protestant would be, and it really pains me to point it, point out to Tertullian, because Tertullian played a great role in my conversion. Because early on, he had a long period of, of being Orthodox. What do I mean by that? I mean, tiny O, meaning he was a practicing Catholic. He believed Catholic things. And then towards the end of his life, he abandons the faith and he becomes a Montanist. He begins to teach poor Christology, poor Mariology, and really begins to interpret things contrary to, to the way the church has always taught. And as we see, Elliot, when you leave the fold of the church and you begin to interpret via your own private interpretation, you pretty much become a forerunner to Luther. Right. So what do you say to people who um, assert that their denomination is, uh, is meant for following the traditions or understanding the apostles, but are not in conformity with the Catholic Church today? Yeah. What I would do, Elliot, is I would look at the Bible. I would tell them, okay, how about we come to the table and we dialogue on the Bible? You want to talk about the Eucharist? Okay, we'll look at uh, Matthew 26 or Mark chapter 12, or we'll look at 1 Corinthians 10 or 1 Corinthians 11 or John 6 all of them which have Eucharistic theology, or the whole book of Hebrews, how about we read them? We go through reading them, and at the end of the day, I will have my interpretation, and they're going to have their interpretation. At the end of the day, Elliot, that particular method is impossible to come to a judgment as to who is correct, because we're both saying, well, I believe that, you believe that, but I believe we have a method in, in determining whose particular reading is correct. Because after we do that, Elliot, we can then open up commentary on the Bible. The very first commentary ever being the early church fathers. We can go to them. Okay, well, I believe um, John is talking about the bread of life is truly the body and blood of our Lord. I can go to church history and look and view the unanimous testimony. Every early father that ever commented on the gospel believes it to be talking about the actual body and blood of our Lord in the Eucharist. And I think when we do it with that particular method, I think we're able to see, okay, well, the Catholic method is rooted and based in the Bible and in early church history, what we would call in early tradition. When we do that, Elliot, and we go through every century, we find that they have a big problem because even Luther despite believing it in a very different way, held to the Eucharist being the body and blood of Christ. So what do we do then? We run into a major problem that later history, later reformers, Calvin, uh, not even Zwingli, Calvin, Francis Turton, uh, and John Wesley, way later ones where it begins to evolve. And are you going to tell me that the church that our Lord established, that he said the gates of hell would never prevail over couldn't get it right for over 1,700 years. Elliot, I dare say, that would point to a very deficient Messiah. Uh, I dare say you run into a lot of problems with that kind of theology. So the early church had to, in a way, protect the traditions that were handed down to them by Christ, um, by the apostles. And, and is it fair to say um, many of the practices or understandings that were rooted in the Old Testament Oh, yeah, no doubt. We have um, you know, the prophecy in, uh, of uh, Melchizedek. We have the prophecy of the Holy Eucharist. We have um, the prophecy of Holy Mary being without sin and the coming of the Messiah in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have uh, Christology galore, and we have teaching of the Holy Trinity all over the Old Testament. So the Old Testament 
is very rich, but I'd like to point uh, to, to another very important thing, very rich in pointing towards our Catholic faith, Elliot. Mm-hmm. And the, the New Testament, all over the place. Here's the one thing I tell, I tell our fellow Catholic brothers um, and sisters, Elliot, don't be afraid to open up your Bible mm. and the dialogue with our evangelical friends. A lot of them mean well. Open it up. The Bible is a Catholic book. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be terrified of it. Rather embrace it because it is a Catholic book. It was given to you by the Catholic Church. It was founded by our Lord, Elliot. There are those that argue that uh, the Holy Spirit gave us the book and that um, somehow, I don't know, they believe perhaps that men just kind of put it together or but would never assent to the idea that it could possibly be a Catholic book. How, how dare you say that or what gives you the right to say that it's a Catholic book? Isn't it for everyone? Or I don't know. Yeah, and a great point you bring up there, Elliot. We, we want to be very clear that the, the Bible is for everyone, but very clearly the Bible is a Catholic book that has Catholic theology laid out within it. Now, when they talk about the Bible being given to us by the Holy Spirit, we, we're, we won't argue that at all. Mm-hmm. But w- the, the Catholic belief is we believe all of our ecumenical councils are protected by the charism under the Holy Spirit. They are protected. Every dogmatic statement is infallible. So we can point to those early local councils. We can point to Hippo, Carthage, Rome 382, Hippo and Carthage 393, 397. And I know people are going to come back and say, well, Elliot, William, those aren't ecumenical. Granted, they're not. But those particular canonical lists were later adopted by ecumenical councils. And all throughout history, unanimously, they held when those councils gathered and declared which books were part of the Bible throughout every century, Elliot, they reaffirmed it. They reaffirmed it. They reaffirmed it. Here's one really important point I want to make for your audience, Elliot. Every time, there is no exception, Elliot. Every time the early church gathered in council to declare what books were part of the Bible, every time it included those deuterocanonical books, those seven books that were later removed by Protestants. There is not one time that they were ever lacking. All throughout history, they were included. And that, to me, tells me they have a mark of apostolicity, meaning they belong in your Bible. And if you don't have them in your Bible, I recommend you get a Catholic Bible and you get to Mass as well. Why were those books removed? Yeah, now th- this does become a very, um, very interesting um, point of discussion. Now, a lot of people beat Luther over the head, uh, and, uh, you know, rightly so. Uh, but, you know, we, gotta, we, we have to be very honest. And when I say honest, we have to be in a scholarly way. Did Luther remove them? No, he didn't. But Luther got the ball rolling. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, why do Catholics say Luther removed them? I'll give you an example. I could pull up a book. Now, pretend it is not. Pretend this is a Bible. And pretend you have your deuterocanonical books, you know, in the middle. You know, they're the Old Testament, uh, wherever they may be. What Luther did was he took those from where they were, and he put them all the way in the back. Now, why did Luther do that? Mm. Luther had, and in essence, by doing that, he lowered their status. And he opened the floodgates for later Protestant groups to totally remove them. Now, people may then say, well, did Luther believe they were part of the Bible? No, he didn't. So Luther is the main culprit because he denigrated them, talked about them being, you know, beneficial, but not the word of God. Why did he do it? Very clearly, Elliot, they taught particularly Catholic doctrine. You've got many of them talking about faith and good works that are needed. You have clearly the Maccabean book too, Second Maccabees, talking about purgatory, clearly talking about purgatory. And you clearly have prayer for the dead in two Maccabees as well. As Luther's theology would evolve and evolve and change, Luther could not have those books being looked at as holy writ, as the word of God. Now, why didn't he totally remove them from his Luther Bible? Maybe he was afraid. But he also lowered not only those books, he lowered the status of the book of James and the book of Hebrews. Why? Very clearly, what does James 2 tell you? 
you're saved by works and not by faith alone. That didn't fit into Luther's theology, Eliot. Luther also added the word, the German word, allein, to Romans 3.28, so that it could read, we're justified by faith alone. And the Bible never says that you're justified by faith alone. So really, the culprit has got to be Luther. They taught particularly Catholic things. Thus, he moved into the back of his Luther Bible, and later Protestant groups, we can identify when. It would be the Synod of Dort, where Protestantism tossed them out. And to this day, uh, Elliot, they're not in Protestant Bibles, but let me shock you. You go to Germany, and a ton of Luther Bibles, modern day ones, they've put them back in. Yeah, I've noticed. So yep. speaking of the patristic fathers, right, and their desire to protect the faith and to pass it down in its fullness, uh, this is quite a job. And, you know, I guess they yeah. did the best that they could battling heresies. And we've had the Great Schism and obviously the Protestant Revolt. Um, yeah. Who are some of these warriors of the faith? Who are some of these patristic fathers? And, um, you know, what are some of the great things that they did? Yeah, if, if I'm going to think of um, one of the greatest, I'm going to have to think of the great Athanasius of Alexandria, who defended the deity of Christ uh, against the Arian revolt. They were denying that our Lord was true God, eternal God. Athanasius was an incredible early father. And then I, I go a little bit um, forward in the history, and I think of the great Saint Cyril of Alexandria, who defended that Mary was the mother of God. The particular term that uh, Cyril defended, Eliot, was the term that Mary was Theotokos, the Greek for God-bearer, that Mary was indeed the mother of God. He defended that against Nestorian. Now, there are many incredible early fathers throughout history. I, I can think of those two great ones, but then another incredible one. I don't want him to get lost to history. The great Pope Leo the Great dubbed the lion. Now, why was he dubbed the lion for the faith? He defended the very truth that our Lord was incarnate God with a human nature and a divine nature and fully God and fully man. So I think of all these incredible defenders of the faith, Elliot, that would have gone to their death defending the faith. And of course, uh, uh, you know, you can't forget the great Ignatius of Antioch who did go to his death. He went to his martyrdom and before dying, Elliot, man, you know, I talk about, um, I love talking about lifting weights and being powerful and being strong, all for the glory of God. But to have even an ounce of the power and faith that Ignatius had on his way to martyrdom, one thing that he does tell us, and he does repeat it more than one time, is he says at one point, I don't even crave real food anymore. I don't crave the food, earthly food. I crave the body of our Lord and the blood of our Lord talking about the Holy Eucharist. He talks about that being the only thing that he's craving, and he knows he's on his way to his death, but he never denies our Lord. Now, Elliot, that is what I call true strength. These sound like amazing men. How do we know about them, or how can we learn more about them? Are there writings? Of course, these aren't biblical writings, but obviously they would be helpful to anybody who's trying to understand the faith. Where do you dig into a study of the patristic pillars or, or of course your channel but the patristic fathers the early fathers yeah the real cool thing elliot is a lot of them are available online for free they can go to new advent and they can find a lot of them there for free now how do we know here's the other thing important thing how do we know the because this does come up it has come up to me very often when i debate now another field of individuals that i've debated very often have been atheists um, atheist scholars, and I've had them say, William, how do you even know that any of those church fathers, really who were they, who they said they were, how do you know the writings weren't messed with, weren't, weren't doctored? Number one, we have a ton of ancient manuscripts, a ton of them, Iliad. Number two, the ancient tradition of the church. You can look at Jerome writing in the fourth century who will identify that Ignatius wrote seven letters. Now we have all of those seven letters and we can do that for all of them. Either there'll be contemporaneous testimony to the writing or we'll have the manuscript tradition to be able to identify they were the author, they did believe that, 
They did live in that era. They did live in that region. We have an incredible testimony and people can read a ton of them for free. They can begin reading them right now. Go to New Advent. A lot of them are there for free. Okay. So the, my next question has to do with scripture and tradition, right? So if we do have the Holy Scripture, which, you know, comes out of the tradition of the church, why, do, why is it that we still practice and venerate a lot of these old traditions? Why, do, why are those things still necessary that the church fathers assert? Now, the one thing that I point to immediately, Elliot, when people will say, because our evangelical friends are going to say, well, what do you practice that isn't laid out in the Bible? And very clearly, Elliot, how do you even know what the Bible is if you don't go into sacred tradition? There is no way of knowing. Now, the idea that the New Testament quotes from every Old Testament book is not true. There is no possible way of knowing what the actual Bible text is, which books are part of the Bible, if you don't go into tradition. Let me give you an example, Elliot. I was dialoguing with a friend of mine who is an evangelical pastor, maybe about a month ago. Uh, and, and I bring this up to almost all of my evangelical friends. I repeat it all the time. I told them, okay, well, we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We agree that they are part of the Gospels. They have the Gospels, the four Gospels, right? Well, why not the Gospel of Thomas or the other Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew or the Gospel of Peter? Why not those? In fact, Elliot, I could take a chapter from one of those and I could lay it out and it would sound very pious, very holy. Why only those, Elliot? Well, I'll tell you why. You've got to go into early tradition to realize how the early church viewed which books were part of the Bible. And the only way you can do that is by going to tradition. You cannot get that from the Bible alone. That's number one. Every evangelical believes the Bible is God-breathed, the Word of God. In order to know what that Word of God is, you've got to go into tradition. What are you going to do? Well, are you going to tell me I got a burning in the belly and I know that book is part of the Bible? Well, if we go by that criteria, well, the Mormons are right. Ellen G. White is right. Muhammad is right if we go by that criteria. But we don't go by that ridiculous criteria. We need to look at early sacred tradition. And in order to know the canon, you've got to go into early tradition. What are some uh, traditions? You mentioned the Eucharist. Maybe let's focus mm -hmm. there. You mentioned the Eucharist. Um, a lot of modern Christians uh, don't believe in transubstantiation. Um, yeah. What evidence do we have that the early fathers believed that the Eucharist was in actual, uh, in, in reality, the body and blood of Jesus Christ? Yeah, that is a great question, Elliot. Now, if we look at, <clears throat> we look at Ignatius, we look at Justin Martyr, the kind of theological points that Ignatius is making and Justin the Martyr only work if they are arguing that they believe the Eucharist was truly the body and blood of Christ. Now, Justin Martyr talks about it being true nourishment and our bodies undergoing a transformation when we partake of the Eucharist. If you look at Ignatius, he'll talk about it being the bread of God and the blood of God. And there's, a, there's two particular Greek words Ignatius will also use. He calls the Eucharist the pharmakon athanasios. Now, what does that mean? That was, those were two Greek terms that would identify a deity. Now, why did he use it? He realized a lot of his audience, the Romans and many others, were Greek readers. And they would argue and believe that their particular deity was God. Well, Ignatius tells them, no, I partake of the real true God. And the Eucharist I partake of is the medicine of immortality. Pharmacon Athanasius directly means medicine of immortality. Directly talking about it being the body and blood of Christ. But if we want to get a little bit more technical, we go to Ambrose, we go to Cyril, we go to many others that use particular Greek words, Eliot, the Greek word metousios, which is the exact same thing 
for transubstantiation. It is a change in substance. They talk about the Eucharist becoming the body and blood of Christ. And then here's another point that I don't hear brought up very often, Elliot, but people will argue and say, well, okay, well, well, how do you account for that and not the Lutheran belief of consubstantiation? Well, I'll tell you how, because when they talk about the prayers over the elements, all of the early fathers say that it is, they, they are no longer regular bread and wine. They're no longer ordinary bread and, bro- bread and wine. They become the body and blood of Christ. Ambrose, Augustine, And many others tell you that if you don't worship the elements, that you are considered, you are committing a grave sin. Now, Eliot, in the early church, there are particular words that are used. There's words used for veneration, and there is one Greek word that you use to worship God and God alone, the Greek word latria. And every early father, writing in Greek or Latin to Greek, utilize the Greek word latria, saying you give latria to the Eucharist. Now, why would you give worship to bread, mere bread, and mere wine? You don't. You worship it because it is God. That is why he was given worship. You can find it all throughout the early father. If there is one thing that you can find unanimously, Elliot, it's a belief that the Eucharist truly is the body and blood of our Lord. Wow, amazing. You mentioned latria. It's a, a a term I learned recently as opposed Mm -hmm. to dulia. And so we have two different types of veneration, uh, that which is offered only to God, which is latria. Um, Catholics will offer dulia, which is veneration to Mary and the saints. What are the thoughts or words on Mary uh, by the early church fathers? What, what was their take on Mary? Yeah, let me I'm, I could try and pull this up uh, so that I don't get the particular passage wrong, Elliot. Um, there we go. I got it. Now I'll, I got it right here. Okay. Okay. Um, the early fathers are very clear, and you find them very early on, Elliot, when we look at a particular writing called the Proto-Evangelium of James, written in the early 100s. And even after that, you have Methodius of Olympus, you have um, Gregory the Wonder Worker, Clement of Alexandria. I'm talking about early era fathers that talk about Mary in an incredible way. If you look at the writing, in the 100s, the Proto-Evangelium of James, Mary is called the fruit of justice. Now, what does that mean? The fruit of righteousness. Talking about Mary being created, being born without any kind of sin. And you find it in every era of church history, Elliot. They believed Mary to be the new Eve. They believed Mary to be the new Ark of the New Covenant. They believed Mary to be ever virgin. By the way, the early fathers were unanimous on that. You won't find one ever diverting from that. They had incredible veneration for Mary, and they believed she was the greatest of God's creations. And Elliot, I'd have to say, they believe it because I would argue it is definitely and definitively laid out in the Bible. Where in the Bible? Yeah. So here is a great, great point. If you look, number one, if you want to talk about Mary being without any sin, it does come up very often. People want to know, well, you, where, are you, where are you getting that from? We begin by pointing people to Genesis 3. Now, why do we point them there, Elliot? You have what is called the Proto-Evangelium there. Now, I want to draw a distinction. A little while ago, I talked about the Proto-Evangelium of James. That is a work written in the early 100s. Now I'm talking about the Proto-Evangelium from the Bible. Proto-Evangelium comes from the Greek protos, which means first, and then euangelion, which means gospel. It means the first good news. And we have a prophecy in Genesis 3, Elliot, that is of a seed that would come from a woman. And we're told right after the fall that there will be an enmity, um, um, a barrier. And by the way, the Greek word and Hebrew word used there for enmity literally means mortal warfare. 
Now we're told that the woman and the seed of the woman would be at enmity with the devil, the serpent. But what does that enmity mean? It means that neither will ever be under the clutches of the devil. That is really important. Primarily, Genesis 3 is a messianic prophecy. But right there in the messianic prophecy, Elliot, you have the mother brought up as well. The woman and the child. By the way, the seed is singular. The woman and her child, which we know is the Messiah, will be at enmity with the devil. Okay, well, how does that mean that Mary had no sin? Well, it was written a long time before Mary was ever created. Way, way, way before. It was a prophecy. <clears throat> but then, Elliot, we encounter Mary in Luke 1. And when we encounter Mary, when the angel Gabriel comes in and greets her, the greeting is an incredibly weird one. Now, why do I say weird? He'll greet Mary. Number one, he greets her in the vocative. He doesn't say, he doesn't appear to her and, and say, Mary. He says, Kyrie kecharitomene. Hail. Having been, literally, I'm going to break it down the little Greek. Hail, having been fully graced. And by the way, when people say, William, that's a fanciful interpretation. No, it isn't. Look at every Greek lexicon or scholar. They will tell you you can translate it that way. And the early church did do it that way. But then, Elliot, here's an important thing. People will say, so what? If you read the book of Acts, we read that Stephen was full of grace as well. You know, why is Mary without sin if St. Stephen also was called full of grace? Well, they're very different Greek words that are used. The Greek word utilized for Mary in Luke 1, 28 to 32, is also only found in one other area, the book of Ephesians chapter 1. What do we find it? When we read about the grace we were supposed to be in possession of before the fall. That's mind-blowing there, Elliot. The mm. particular kind of grace that God wanted us to be in full possession of before the fall. Now, what kind of grace is that? Ephesians 1 tells you a sinless, stainless kind of grace. That exact Greek word, and I'm not making it up. People can Google it. They can look it up. Go to a, a Bible dictionary. I am not making it up. That exact root Greek word there is utilized for Mary in Luke 1, in Kecharitomene. Remember, the Greek word is karutao. Mary is called Kecharitomene. Hail having been full of grace. Mary is in full possession of that particular grace that was lost in the garden. That is why one particular reason why we call her completely without sin. Indeed, in the early church, Eliot, one particular Greek word title for Mary was amomos, which meant stainless. Now, there are a lot of titles for Mary. Panagia, uh, ai parthenos, which means ever virgin. And I think you get the point. Mary was greatly honored. We give Mary what we call hyperdulia because we believe Mary to be the greatest of God's creation. A lot of people think that uh, Catholics have made things up and just added things to the faith, but it sounds like many of the Catholic practices or modern, you know, things we're doing today actually come from the early fathers, from the early church. These are these are ancient beliefs and practices. There are different ideas about justification and salvation today. Um, you know, where those who believe that uh, justification is imparted up on us as opposed to being infused. Um, different things like once saved, always saved, different, you know, Protestant ideas. What did the early fathers believe and say about justification and sanctification? Yeah, here's a great one. Now, as early as the letter of Pope Clement of Rome, writing either 95 AD or the early 100s, if you read the letter, he will talk about being justified by good works. And of course, if you Whenever we talk about good works, they can only be done with faith in our Lord. We recognize that. But everywhere you go, Elliot, every century, you read about fathers that believed in baptismal regeneration. 
Baptism saves you. 1 Peter 3, this baptism now saves you. You find it all over the Bible, and you find it all in the early church fathers as well. You don't find any early father that believed that you could be um, saved by faith alone. But hold on. We want to be very careful. Our evangelical friends will come back, and they will tell you, well, William and Elliot, there are a lot of early fathers that believed in faith alone. And they're going to point to Augustine, John Chrysostom, and many others. And indeed, we want to be fair to them. Some early fathers do use the term faith alone. The thing is, so Elliot, the very, very clear thing is they're not talking about faith alone the way Luther believed in it. If you look at Chrysostom and many others, they talk about a faith that was living, a faith that was working through love. None of them believed in a mere intellectual kind of ascent and you would be saved. No, they believed that faith had to be working and living and acting out in order for it to be efficacious. And you're right about that. Today, a big divide we have is we'll talk to our evangelical friends and they'll say, well, we don't believe in infused righteousness. We believe in imputed. Now, Elliot, what does that really amount to? I got to be very clear. It really does amount to not being truly sanctified, a true change in you. But if you read Revelation 21, you read that nothing impure can enter into heaven. Now, if nothing impure can enter into heaven, do you really think that imputed righteousness is going to get you into heaven? No, you've got to have it infused in you. You've got to become a new creation, as John chapter 3 tells you. You have to be born again. And by the, by, by the way, uh, John 3, uh, the book of Romans, all over the Bible, it talks about you, your old self dying and you being resurrected in you in Christ. That really is talking about you be having undergoing a kind of change. And by the way, there was a book, Elliot, uh, by the name of a gentleman by the name of McGrath, Alistair McGrath, by the way, who made it popular that the early fathers taught um, imputed righteousness. And it was a textbook used for like 20 years by evangelicals. Well, not even five years ago, he had to come back and say, I've got to rewrite it. I was wrong all along. I was misreading the way those fathers taught. I'm talking about a Protestant scholar, Elliot. Now, we only hope that the other ones can take notice of that and realize not even one early father taught what Luther taught. And that was really, if we want to talk about major debates at the Reformation, faith alone and scripture alone were two huge ones. Hmm. So the early church, uh, I would imagine, looked different than the church today. And there are those that would uh, assert that it was very loosely organized and that um, you know, it was more of an underground sort of hidden thing and there was no real... Uh, structure, but today we have the magisterium. Um, what do the early church fathers say about uh, organize, the organizational structure of the church itself? Let me give you, a, let me begin by noting that I'm going to bring up a very, very obscure figure by the name of Paul of Samosata, a condemned heretic. And then I'm going to talk about Arius, and then I'll talk about Pelagius. These early heretics, Eliot, had their writings by and large removed from every catalog and every database. They were ordered to be burned. And today, we can reconstruct a ton of them and know what they believed. Why do I bring that up? Because if there were any underground Protestant groups that existed, we would know about them. You know, one writing, one document, anything to history there is nothing there is only the one catholic church that we have in history laid out through document church father council after council and when we look at that when we look at the organization every time the early church gathered in council we have the head of the church the pope of rome whether you like him or not look i know pope francis is a divisive figure but he's the vicar of Christ. He is the successor of St. Peter. 
We had a pope in the early church. Look at Pope Clement. Pope Clement was not happy in the 100s or late 90s when he wrote to the church of Corinth. But he wrote to him and told him, get your act together. And he wrote in an authoritative fashion. And he, towards the end of it, he tells him, you know, you get your act together because I am the one that is the head of this church. You look at Irenaeus talking about Rome being having that preeminence. Every era of church history, you have the Bishop of Rome, you have the other bishops as well, you have deacons, you have priests, you have the model that you have today in the Catholic Church, Elliot. I, you know, I hate to sound crude, but you wouldn't walk into a church in 350 and have a man there at the pulpit wearing a suit and tie. No, you'd walk in and you'd have a man looking like a priest with priestly vestments talking about the Gospels and giving the Holy Eucharist to the people and saying Mass, uh, lifting up prayers for the dead. Here's one thing, Elliot, that just blows me away. And I use this example all the time. When I talk to my evangelical friends, I say, imagine you are a churchgoer, a regular guy in the pew, or a regular girl in the pew. And you died in the year 350. Imagine the Lord allows you to come back to earth for one day, man, one day. You're going to have fun. You're going to eat food, eat good food, have Coke, Diet Coke, a beer or whatever. And, you know, everything in a responsible way. And, you know, you're allowed to go to church. You're not allowed to go to church. You come to a road, Elliot. On the left-hand side, you got a Protestant service. On the right hand, you got a Catholic one. Imagine that Christian that comes back to earth from the fourth century. Imagine he or she walk into either one, sit through the whole service, Elliot. Now I want to ask you, what church would they recognize? The one, the Catholic one, where they taught prayer for the dead, the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ, venerated Mary, believed in purgatory, all of these things that were believed at that time of that person and even before and taught in the Bible, or they go to the evangelical one. Or in the evangelical one, you don't give any honor to Mary. You don't give any honor to the saints. They're dead. You don't have any windows, stained glass. You don't have any images like the early church did have. Uh, you don't believe in these particular things that were taught in the time of that person. Now, you tell me, Elliot, which church would this person identify with best? And if you come down to the conclusion that it's the Catholic Church, well, then our evangelical friends have a major problem with history because they cannot pick any time in history until way later to be able to identify with a church. That, to me, says a lot, Elliot. So there is a big difference between what happens on Sundays uh, between the Catholic Church, the ancient church, even the Orthodox liturgy is similar, uh, as opposed to yeah. Sunday service. Um, mm -hmm. How was the early church going about uh, their Sunday obligations? What you know, you're kind of alluding to it now, but um, what did the liturgy look like in its original form, and why did they do it the way that they did it way back then? Yeah. yeah. Now, the beauty of the Catholic faith, Elliot, as you know very well, is a multifaceted beauty. Now, wh wherever, whatever kind of liturgy we look at. We look at the liturgy of the great uh, John Chrysostom, the Greek liturgy, or we look at the Latin liturgy, the amazing liturgy of the great Ambrose, or let me broaden it for our Oriental friends. We look at the liturgy of the great Ephraim or the great Jacob of Sarug, and you're looking at Latin, you're looking at Greek, you're looking at Syriac, and they're very, very different in terms of language, but in terms of what is going on, it is the very same thing. Now, Elliot, let me give you one example. Today, sadly, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox are, are uh, we're not together anymore. That schism happened. But even before that schism, one lesser one that people don't know of was when the Catholic and the Oriental Orthodox broke up. That was in the um, fifth century. Now, when I was working on my book on the Eucharist, I reached out to a scholar of the Oriental Orthodox, and of the Eastern Orthodox. And I said, would you gentlemen 
help write a chapter for me in the book. And at the end of the day, Elliot, even though we come from different language traditions, we're saying the exact same thing. Any Eastern Orthodox you run into, they believe what we believe in the Eucharist. Any Oriental Orthodox you run into, they believe what we believe in the Eucharist. Even though you may have Syriac, Greek, and Latin, utilizing different language, we all believe that the bread and the wine, after the invocation, become the true, the real body and blood of Christ. Elliot, you don't have that in Protestantism. And I know, today, I know the movement that has become popular. The movement of, no, no, we do believe in the real presence. But then you get, you get to removing all those layers. What do you mean by that? And they'll tell you, well, we believe God is truly present beside us, but not there before you, but beside us, but not there in the elements. Very, very different, Elliot. It really does amount to a symbolic Eucharist, and that what couldn't have been further from the minds of the early church. They did not believe in a symbolic Eucharist. And so we also have the sacrifice that happens at the Mass, right? And there are those that will say, you know, you Catholics are sacrificing Christ again every Sunday. Um, how did the early church uh, approach that? Was there a sacrifice happening every Sunday? Yeah, that's a great one. And as we know, the Eucharist hearkens to that one sacrifice on Calvary. But here's the other thing, Elliot. People will say, well, well, how, if, it, if it is hearkening to that one sacrifice on Calvary, what is the language in the Bible that will indicate that? Everything we read in 1 Corinthians 11, in 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and 11, in Matthew 26, in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Now, when we read them, Elliot, in 1 Corinthians 11, we read about this remembrance that must be given. And this particular Greek word utilized there is the Greek word anamnesis, which is connected with sacrifice. But not only that, Elliot, when you look at the new covenant, the new covenant, this is my body being given for you. All of it is sacrificial language. All of it is pointing to that one sacrifice given for all on Calvary. We don't re-sacrifice our Lord at every Mass. That is a major misinterpretation. But do we believe the Eucharist is a sacrifice? Without a doubt. The Bible lays it out for you. And the early fathers were unanimous. And I want to add one other thing. Even Luther believed that as well. Luther, it really isn't until you get, I believe, to Calvin that you really get a major, yeah, I believe it's Calvin. And then, of course, we get to the era of the other reformer, Francis Turretin. By the time you get to Turretin, you got major anti-Catholicism there already. Hmm. And so uh, thereby removing elements of the ancient mass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. M massively removing elements. Indeed, look, you got Luther. Luther who really, really is, you know, in essence, we got to be clear. To my Lutheran friends that want to argue that Luther did not want to create a new, a new religion, Luther did just that. And Luther opened the door for uh, people to come later to remove things like veneration of Mary, giving honor to Mary, uh, prayer for the dead, purgatory, and the belief in the Holy Mass. As we know very well, after Luther, you get to Calvin, a full denial of it, and a full denial of prayer for the dead. After Calvin, a gentleman who's considered probably even greater than Calvin, Turretin, a Francis Turretin, another reformer, big time anti-Catholic, removed all elements of the mass, no prayer for the dead, no purgatory, uh, really, really no veneration of Mary either. And as you go on and on, Eliot, as history goes on and on, you really get to removing all of these apostolic elements. And look, you get to where you are today in a lot of these evangelical communions where you don't have anything that even remotely resembles the early church. Look, I get it. I'll, they'll point to us and say, well, look, you guys have a lot of those beautiful youth revivals where people sing and what have you. Why can't we have that? You can have whatever you want. At the end of the day, if you don't have a valid, number one, 
You can't have a valid Eucharist if you don't have a valid priesthood. They don't have a valid priesthood. They are not part of the one true church of Christ. And when they lack all of those elements, Elliot, we really have to call them, call them home, really. Not call them to, we call them to a better understanding, but ultimately they, they've got to become Catholic. We want them to become Catholic. And so there are no priests because uh, a priest is he who offers sacrifice, correct? That is correct. That is correct. He that will offer sacrifice, and they have got to obviously be part of that unbroken lineage that goes right back to the beginning. Uh, we Today, we recognize, if we want to talk about valid priesthood, we recognize the Oriental Orthodox have a valid priesthood. And we recognize our Eastern Orthodox friends have a valid priesthood as well, but evangelicals do not have a valid priesthood. Uh, am I correct? Uh, I heard somewhere that the Catholic Mass, and even the Orthodox, Orthodox Mass, resembles the, me, the way of worship that the Jews had beforehand. So they had the liturgy of the yeah. word and then the sacrifice that would happen at the temple. Is that correct, that we're almost actually... Um, Grow our our mass grows out of the ancient worship practices of uh, the Hebrew practices. Yeah, without yeah, a without a doubt, you are definitely a hundred percent correct there. Indeed, you can point to today. This is one major dig um, where we can point to a clear break within Islam, where Islam Muhammad attempted to retain a lot of what was present in his particular area of Christianity, but clearly did not retain that one particular aspect. And if we look today, the Oriental Orthodox retain it, the Byzantine retain it. When I mean Byzantine, I mean Easterns retain, retain it. And of course, the Catholic Church has retained it as well. It, it looks exactly like it would have been laid out in the Old Testament. A priesthood, we've got the liturgy, as the Greek lays it out, the liturgus, liturgy of the word, the, uh, the Holy Mass, is a great representation of exactly what was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And by the way, the only reason I, I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for it, uh, but I challenge any Muslim that wants to debate me on that particular issue, there is a clear break there. There's a break in many areas. There's a break also in their denial of our Lord as eternal God. Now, funny enough, Elliot, in, in Islam, they have great veneration of Mary which is really, really weird. Why would they have great veneration of Mary? I'll tell you why. In Islam, in the particular area where Muhammad, where Muhammad wrote the Quran, where Muhammad learned of his religion, there he was surrounded by a lot of individuals that retained a lot of the Catholicity on Mary. Thus, you find today in Islam, they have no problem affirming Mary as ever virgin. Believe it or not, here's another thing not very well known. A lot of them have no problem affirming the bodily assumption of Mary. And a lot of them have no problem affirming Mary had no sin either. Where we have a clear break is that they won't affirm Mary as mother of God. Now, why don't they do that? Because they don't believe our Lord is eternal God. Hmm. So um, just kind of following up with that, God shows Israel how to sacrifice. This is what was pleasing to him. Yep. Um, and then sends his son to be that sacrifice. In other words, he does it for them. Are, I don't know, honestly, are Jews still practicing the sacrifice in the temple today, or has that finished completely? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're unfortunately, Elliot, they are still wait, waiting for their Messiah. So uh, today you will find a lot of the elements of uh, what we would call the Old Testament. They don't call it the Old Testament. Never approach the Old Testament the way you do and tell the Jew that you're reading from the Old Testament. They don't believe it to be the Old Testament. They believe that to be their Bible today. So you're going to find a lot of the old elements that we don't practice anymore still being practiced by them today, that being one of them. And they also are awaiting, they're still awaiting for the Messiah today. But we tell them the Messiah has come and we can prove that to them not only from the New Testament writings, Elliot, but from the writings of early figures, early enemies of the faith. And we believe our faith is a historic faith. We can point to the facts of it throughout history. And that is another area where I am totally fascinated by Elliot. The fact that 
when we talk about our Catholic faith, we have a lot of Jewish elements there. Now, what do we mean by Jewish elements? We mean that what was prophesied in the Old Testament has come to its fulfillment. So we can point to, here is one particular incredible thing, that today you don't hear a lot about the Jews talking about it. In the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, Elliot, you have a figure called the angel of the Lord. Now, early Jews, Josephus, and many early Jewish writers were confused. Well, who is that angel of the Lord? Who is that figure that disappears to history? Well, for us, the early church believed that angel of the Lord was Christ. Now, people may get confused. What do you mean? You're calling Christ an angel? You're a Jehovah's Witness now? No. When we talk about angel of the Lord, we don't mean a winged figure. The Greek word angel, angelos, means one that is sent. Our Lord was sent by the Father. In the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is not a literal winged figure. Rather, the angel is a messenger from heaven sent by the Father who is identified as Yahweh all over the Old Testament, Eliab, identified as Yahweh. When we come into the New Testament, our Lord identifies himself as that figure of the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord that led his people out of Egypt, out of bondage. Well, today Jewish people are confused. How could this angel in the Old Testament be portrayed as Yahweh, be sacrificed to, be worshipped as God, and yet, you know, we don't really know who that figure is. But in history, as a Catholic, we do know who that figure is. That figure is our would become our incarnate Lord. And when we say become, we mean he would come into creation. The incarnation would happen. But when we talk about the divine nature of our Lord, that is eternal. I want to be very clear. The divine nature of our Lord is eternal without beginning. But the incarnation happened at a period in time. He was literally born of a virgin, as Matthew 1 and Luke 1 lay out. And as was prophesied, Elliot, talking about Judaism, Isaiah 7, a virgin will give birth, was prophesied in the Old Testament. What did the early church and the fathers uh, believe about icons? You know, you have some people today that will say, oh, that's... Yeah. Um, it's sinful to create a graven image. Um, how did they receive that, and what was their practice back then? Yeah. The one thing I like to point to, Elliot, would be, if you look in the Old Testament, <clears throat> you look at the book of Exodus, you have idols that are condemned. Now, people are going to point to the, the, the Hebrew and the Greek, and they're going to say, well, that's a graven image. Yeah, you're right. But what kind of a graven image? We're literally told the kind of graven image that is condemned is one that is an idol. Now, that particular image in Exodus 32 that is condemned, the golden calf, and any image that becomes an idol is condemnatory, Elliot. Now, what do we mean by an idol? Well, they worshipped it as God. Now, I've heard the other argument. They'll say, well, no, they weren't that dumb. No, they truly worshipped it as God. They said, the calf your God that led your people out of Israel. That's, uh, that is the utmost blasphemy, Elliot. They elevated a created thing, a gold thing. They elevated the status of deity and they called it a God. That is what was condemned, idolatry. But then if we talk about images, you had the bronze serpent that was utilized. Now, you had the Ark of the Covenant which had cherubim atop it. You had all the uh, Solomon's temple. Now I know the other argument that will be levied, Elliot, they're gonna say, well, but people began to worship the bronze serpent and that had to be destroyed. Granted, things can become idols. You are not to worship anything but the one true God. But are images good? They are good. The very Ark of the Covenant where the early Jews believed God dwelt. The Shekinah, the glory cloud, was believed to be the glory of Yahweh. There, were image, there was imagery right there in the Ark of the Covenant. But let me add one other thing, Elliot. 
one thing that I rarely hear ever brought up. In the book of Ezekiel, we have what is considered a idealized vision that the prophet has. Now, what kind of a vision does he have? Well, he has a vision where a messenger of God appears before him and he tells him, this is how the temple should look. Now, how do we know that? Well, he tells him, all of this is pleasing to God. It gives glory to God. It pleases God. And you find it in Ezekiel 44, <coughs> where you read about the prophet having a vision of a temple. Now, remember, think about temple. You think about where the Jews would go and they would worship. This was the temple where the Jews would go and worship. And the prophet had a vision that this was the temple of God. Well, if you walk into the temple, Elliot, all over the wall, there are adornments. But let me add an incredible thing. In the temple, in the church of the early Jews, there were images of angels carved on the wall. The Greek word utilized there is the Greek word geglumena. That Greek word means carved. They're all over the place. Angels, as we know, are the representatives of God in heaven. Now, if you can have representatives of God in heaven in a vision where we're told that this pleases God, you can have beautiful imagery, gold in the temple of God all over the, New, uh, the Old Testament. Why can you not have it in the new covenant of God, under the new covenant? Well, Elliot, you can, and you do have it. Because if we look throughout early church history, the Dura Europos church, there were images in the early church. We read from Methodius of Olympus, early, early writer. We read from Clement of Alexandria. And I can go through every era of church history where they talk about images that are being used in their church services. And I, I want to remind people of one thing. Remember, before you get to the 300s, 313 or 314, the Edict of Milan which legalized Christianity, it was illegal to be a Catholic before that. You couldn't set up your own church and worship without worrying about being beheaded. You couldn't do that. Yet they would find a way to have a cave church and they would find a way to have images in their churches, Elliot, from the very beginning. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, what about the church th uh, father's thoughts on purgatory? What did the early yeah. church believe yeah. about that? Man, I love talking about purgatory, Elliot. Um, uh, be very clear there. Purgatory is all about the mercy and love of Christ. The one thing that totally blows me away, Elliot, is that in every era of church history, you have the belief of purgatory. Indeed, you have it laid out in 1 Corinthians 3. In 1 Corinthians 3, where St. Paul is talking, look, you know, if you want to talk about people being mad, Open up 1 Corinthians 3, and Paul is smacking the Corinthians around um, in a spiritual way, telling them, look, look, guys, I've been here over and over, and you guys don't get your act together. You're living carnally. You're not living in a spiritual way. And here's the other thing, Elliot. You're living in a factious way. Some are of Apollo, some are of Paul. You know, look, man, he didn't want, Christ did not want schism. He wanted unity. So Paul is telling them, look, we're being killed every day, man. Every day we're being martyred and judgment day is coming for you. And he tells them in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in the beginning, and then we get to the really important meat and potatoes right around verse 10 and on, where he says, judgment day is coming. Some people are going to be saved. Some will be saved by fire. And others, he tells you in verse 17, will be destroyed. Now, by destroyed, he means a perpetual destruction. He means they'll be in hell. But here's the amazing thing, Elliot. Right there, beginning in verse 13 and 15, he will talk about how certain people are saved by fire. Now, you stop and you think, okay. Before that, he will talk about people being saved. If you've built with good material, You've built with gold, silver, and precious stones, but then other people built with wood, hay, and straw. Those are metaphors for how you lived your life. The Greek for gold, silver, and precious stones 
Those Greek words are used in the Old Testament to talk about Solomon's temple. Beautiful, ornate temple. He will utilize those metaphors to say, hey, you lived a beautiful life. You're going to heaven. You're going to get your crown. Wood, hay, and straw? Well, those aren't so good. If you've lived an imperfect life, he tells you, you will be saved, uses the Greek word so-so. But how? So as through fire. Now, here's the other thing I hear so often, Elliot. People will say, well, William and Elliot, through fire is used all over the Bible. Why would through fire here mean purgatory? Because, Elliot, every time, and I have looked in the TLG, which is the Sars Lingua Grecia, everywhere you look in the Old and the New Testament, anytime you have precious metals with the Greek words dia paras, through fire, every time, it is talking about a purification. In 1 Corinthians 3, who's being purified? The man, we're told, the man or woman, we're told he will be saved, dia paras, through fire. But it is a purifying fire, Elliot. That is exactly what we mean by purgatory. One that has lived an imperfect life, but lived a life in Christ, not through mortal sin, not died in mortal sin. That person will be saved through a purifying fire. And if you look in the early church, Elliot, from the very beginning, Clement of Alexandria, writing in the 100s, will tell you, some people, at the end of their life, will get their crown. Others will have to undergo purification, a painful one. And But, but he uses beautiful imagery, Elliot. He says, after that painful purifying you undergo, you will pass on to the beautiful mansion. And then in the 200s, you read Cyprian of Carthage, He'll talk about a prison in the afterlife where you will have to undergo a purificatory fire before entering into glory. Elliot, I can point to the 100s, two, three, four, five. Every era of church history, without any exception, we find the unanimous belief in purgatory all throughout the early church fathers. Amazing. Thank you. It's so interesting that so many of these ideas have fallen out of fashion, so to speak but they're all right there at the beginning. In my search for understanding the early church, I came across a small book called the, the Didache. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. The Didache. Yeah, definitely. Or, or if I'm, yeah. how is it oh, yeah. pronounced? Uh, Didache or Didache. 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 It doesn't matter. And apparently it's the, yeah. the teachings of the apostles. Yeah. Um, could yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you have a great early writing, call, and indeed, um, earlier when I was talking about the apostolic fathers, I don't always bring up the Didache. Why is that? Because we don't have a particular author that will be attached to that, but that can be written down as an apostolic era writing. That is a very early writing. In there, you have, you have a method of how to baptize, but you have so much wrapped within there as well. You even have, even though I don't remember it off the top of my head, you have a clear, clear Christological reference to our Lord, and it utilizes a particular Greek word that is hearkening to our Lord as Yahweh. It's a very early writing showing that very early on, the early church, church had a particular structure to it. Now, I wish I remember exactly where that was. I promise after the show airs, I'll post a link down there. Uh, that I don't remember off the top of my head but an incredible, really, really important early writing. And Elliot, what that writing does, is it shows you very early on, the early church had a particular structure to it, and that structure would evolve. Now, what do we mean by evolve? We don't mean that anything would change or anything would be added. No, we mean that as time goes on and as other heresies begin to pop up, well, early church councils would have to use similar formulas to show, look, this is what the early fathers in the Bible had believed from the very beginning, but you find it laid out as early on as the Didache. What a great, great example there. Amazing. Thank you. And as we're um, running up on time here, I want to mention I did bring a copy of your book. Uh, one of them, which is Mary Among the Evangelists. I also have your book yeah. on the Eucharist, which I would invite awesome. people to go out and check out. Uh, your YouTube channel, Patristic Pillars. 
Yep. And what else you got going on? Yeah, and where find where would you like to direct people who are interested in more of your apologetics? Yeah. 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 Now, Bailey came out with a new book that I'm going to get that book to you. I'm going to get it to you real fast. All of it on the papacy. Really, really happy uh. with that. We got a lot of... Uh, we got an endorsement from the former head of the Vatican Theological uh, Commission there, uh, the Reverend Dr. Vinandi. He endorsed that book. So we're really happy with that book. Um, but other than that, Elliot, I, I, would, I would hope that your audience would pray for me. I'm doing a lot of debating uh, atheists, Muslims, Protestants, um, and I'm doing something I've never done before in my life. In 2023, I am branching off into debating in German and debating in Spanish. Um, and I'm hoping that will go well because I, even though I know the languages, I have never in my life debated in them before. And um, I'm going to need a lot of prayer. Wow. <laughs> but, so um, you're not going to have you know, a translator. You're going to speak it and hear it yourself. I, I am going to do it all on my own. I am, um, <laughs> in fact, what I've been doing for the past 10 days, I have been translating documents from Greek and, because you can't do English to uh, Spanish. That won't work well. I've been doing Greek to uh, Spanish and Greek to uh, uh, German and um, just really hoping uh, uh, it goes, they go well. And I really would hope that your audience does, uh, does pray. Man, for you. that's, I appreciate your courage and your willingness and your, your studiosity, if that's a word, but <laughs> your willingness to dive deep, learn and share brother, such an inspiration. And I appreciate Amen. your time here again today, bro. I, hey, Elliot, anytime I get uh, to talk with you, brother, I, I have an incredible time. I had a great time talking with you. And, and one thing I, I do want to add uh, for, you, for your audience, um, do, do a big favor. You'd be doing a great favor to me and to Elliot. Uh, don't just hit like. Uh, share every video Elliot's putting out. Putting out incredible material. The other day I, I, was, I was working out. I got the alert in my phone. I pulled it up. You know, you're doing great material, Elliot. And I want to really promote it and say, everybody... If you're watching it, don't only hit the like button. You go a long way by commenting for the algorithm and sharing the material because there's not a lot of really high-end Catholic material out there. And brother, I pray for you all the time. I hope you keep doing what you're doing. I hope people share it. And I hope it goes, it blows up on the internet. Amen. Button. Thank you so much, William. And uh, we'll get you back with your new book on the papacy because that's a, that's a big one to awesome. dive into. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next time. For now, done. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.